Good evening. I'm Jim McAdams, and I'm the director of the Nanovic Institute for European Studies. Um, we were just talking about when we should start, and all of a sudden, all of you just became still. So I don't, I don't know how that happened, but it must be some kind of mystical power in the room. Um, we are, uh, I am really, really thrilled to see so many of you here for this uh, big, this important event. Uh, it's just, uh, it's just wonderful. Um, I've been telling both of our guests today that it is exam time. The students are a little bit stressed out and uh, life might seem a little challenging at this point, but uh, I look around the audience and I see a lot of my students, so this is a good sign. So thank you everybody for coming. Ladies and gentlemen, one, years, one year ago I called Ambassador J.D. Bindenagel to seek his advice on, where's J.D.? There's Ambassador Bindenagel. To seek his advice on whom the Nanovic Institute should invite to Notre Dame to commemorate the fall of the Berlin Wall on November 9th, 1989, and of course also the reunification of Germany on October 3rd, 1990. It seemed to both of us that we should invite someone with an intimate understanding of the circumstances under which this historic opening of East Germany's border took place. But it would also be important to find a speaker who would have the critical perspective to evaluate the implications of these developments for Germany, for the Atlantic Alliance, and for the world today. And fortunately for everyone here in the audience, we have found exactly the right person, and he's with us tonight. Dr. Horst Telchik may rightly be considered as, the, as both the consummate insider when one considers his role as national security advisor to German Chancellor Helmut Kohl during the heady days of national reunification and simultaneously the consummate outsider in his ability after those days to interpret and analyze German, German foreign policy in the 21st century. Born in 1940 in the Sudetenland in what is currently part of the Czech Republic, uh, our guest left with uh, his family uh, to Germany, first to, to Bayern, to Bavaria, and um, then eventually ended up in Berlin, where he studied political science and contemporary history at the Free University uh, with the really eminent scholar and historian Richard Leuventhal, uh, who, whose work uh, many of us know. During this period, Dr. Telchik became active in Christian democratic politics. He was a first a leader in Germany's Catholic student movement, and we know something about Catholicism at Notre Dame. Uh, and then he moved to Bonn, where in 1972, he earned the esteem and trust of an ambitious Christian democratic politician and minister president named Helmut Kohl. For the next 19 years, our guests could be counted among Kohl's closest advisors. He worked in all of the areas most relevant to German foreign policy and security policy and was director of his chief's parliamentary office. When Kohl became federal chancellor in 1982, Telchik was named national security advisor, charged with everything from the development of West Germany's ties with East Germany, the strengthening of relations with the United States, and all aspects of the Soviet East European relationship. It was in this capacity, of course, that our guest played the lead role in steering his country through the immensely complicated and epic-making process of unification. When Dr. Telchik retired from government in 1991, he then became what, in our perspective, is the consummate outsider, the consummate observer of his country's politics, economics, and foreign policy. He first became CEO of the Bertelsmann Foundation, the largest private nonprofit foundation in Germany. In 1993, he was made the chief advisor uh, for, the business, for business and political affairs on the board of BMW. He followed up this appointment when he was made president of Boeing Germany. And today he is, or maybe he has just stepped down as chair 
of the Munich Conference on Security Policy. In all of these lofty accomplishments, I would also like to add that Dr. Chelchik has a maintained a reputation for open-mindedness, generosity, and approachability. Um, he wouldn't remember this, but in uh, 1988, when I was a, a, an idealistic young assistant professor, uh, my family and I were living in Bonn, and uh, one of the wonderful things in those days is if you wanted to speak to anybody incredibly important, all you had to do was call them on the phone. For some reason, very few major politicians had assistants. And so I think I called up and you answered the phone. And I said, well, can I come see you? And you said, sure, which day? This would be very unusual in the United States. <laughs> and so I was kind of uh, starry-eyed and starstruck. And um, I went to see Dr. Talchik in his office in the Bundeskanzleramt in Bonn. And um, it was really one of the very best interviews I had uh, during that long stay in Germany. Uh, because I felt like uh, we could talk about things as they really were. We could talk about world politics, about Deutschlandpolitik, relations with East Germany, in a way that made sense to me and that really taught me something. This is not always true when you talk to politicians. But of course, Dr. Telchik was not a politician. I am honored, therefore, to introduce you to Dr. Horst Telchik, who will share his insight tonight on the subject, the fall of the wall and its implications for German foreign policy and insider's perspective. Welcome to Notre Dame, Dr. Telchik. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Mr. McAdams, for your kind in introduction. Uh, being praised for such a long time as you did, uh, I feel myself, myself always close to a funeral, you see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, hopefully there is somebody who will praise me as well. <laughs> uh, well, I'm, very, I'm really delighted to be here, and uh, it was uh, my old friend, J.D., uh, who pushed me hard to come here. But uh, it's a real pleasure, and I'm really imp deeply impressed uh, what I could see today. Uh, uh, this is a, a brilliant, a, a marvelous uh, university. And I think all students can be proud to be here. Uh, I think all German students would be jealous uh, uh, watching uh, what, what opportunities students get here. Great, great university, and I wish you all the best for the future. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, I do know I have to sing for my supper. Uh, <laughs> Before I'll uh, start singing, I have to apologize m for my English, but it might be better than your German. But, <laughs> I, uh, but uh, I met so many people uh, this evening who speak very good uh, German, and uh, they are partly Austrian or from Austria or Germany. Uh, therefore, I got the impression I could speak in German as well. Eh? Uh, well, it's a great honor and pleasure for me to talk to such a, a distinguished audience at the famous Notre Dame University about the fall of the wall 20 years ago and its implications for today. In 2009, we are celebrating not only the 20th anniversary of the fall of the wall on November 9, uh, 89, we are celebrating several other events which strongly contributed to the revolution in the former GDR. On August 24, 89, Tadeusz Mazowiecki from the Solidarność movement became the first free elected democratic prime minister of the Warsaw Pact countries. Solidarność founded in 1980 was the first and most successful grassroots movement 
toppling a communist system. And I tell you, uh, I was negotiating, uh, I was the special envoy of the German Chancellor to negotiate a common declaration between uh, both governments in 89. Therefore, I could closely watch uh, the transition happening in Poland. I started my negotiations with Rakowski, the last communist prime minister, and then I had to continue with the first uh, democratic elected uh, prime minister. And uh, therefore, I could really watch uh, uh, the, the, the fundamental change happened uh, in Poland uh, long before a demonstration started in, in the GDR. And I was wondering why uh, there was not uh, immediate uh, repercussion on, on the GDR. Uh, it took much time uh, to start there. And this year I have already celebrated two 20th anniversaries with the Hungarians. In May 89, the Hungarian government had decided not to maintain the Iron Curtain for cost reasons. In June 89, the Hungarian Foreign Minister Jula Horn and his Austrian counterpart Alois Mock symbolically cut the barbed wire between their countries. And in August 89, Prime Minister Miklos Nemet and Jula Horn came to Bonn telling Chancellor Helmut Kohl that they would open the border on September the 10th for all German refugees. Ten of thousands of GDR refugees were allowed to cross the border to the west. And I tell you, I, uh, we started to uh, negotiate with the Hungarians only already in 84. I, I was asked by the uh, new Hungarian ambassador who came to my office uh, to introduce himself uh, he told me already in 84, this was a time when we just uh, had started to deploy American nuclear systems in uh, Germany. And when uh, uh, the, the Soviets, the Soviet government threatened us with a third world war. And uh, I took part uh, in a meeting with Chancellor Helmut Kohl and Secretary General Andropov in July 83 in uh, in uh, Moscow when he uh, uh, told us, when he told the chancellor, if you would, if you would, uh, if you would deploy American nuclear missiles uh, in Germany, we will uh, establish a fence of missiles against uh, Germany. And uh, because uh, there are students, uh, I would like to, to demonstrate a, such a kind of meeting because uh, uh, I, I met a hell lot of uh, Soviet uh, secretary generals. When I met first, uh, together with Helmut Kohl, uh, Brezhnev, he was already very sick. He couldn't answer questions. Only, he could answer questions only when uh, Gromyko, his foreign minister, uh, wrote the answer on a paper and gave him, gave him the answer, and he read the answer to, Ch to Helmut Kohl. He was quite sick. And when we met uh, Antropov in the Kremlin, he, uh, he stood beside his chair because he couldn't move anymore. And we had to go around the table and to shake hands, said hello. Then we went uh, to the other side of the table, sitting down. And uh, he had his hands were on, uh, lying on the table, and uh, we discussed uh, uh, a situation, uh, uh, what he described, close to a third world war. And when he lifted his hand, he was trembling like that, you see? And my counterpart, he had a nice uh, name, uh, Alexandrov Agentov. Uh, Agentov means agent. Uh, uh, Alexander Agentov, uh, he was short-sighted and uh, his, uh, with his head nearly to the paper. And when, when he raised, 72 years old, when he raised his hand, he was trembling as well, like that, you see? 
And now you have, vis a vis the world power, Soviet Union. Yeah? The head of this world power threatening you with the Third World War. And you know how sick they are. You can watch it. Yeah? And uh, this is not a comfortable situation. Yeah? <laughs> and uh, as you know, uh, 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 eight months later, he died. And then Chernyenko came up. We went to the funeral of Andropov to be sure that he is really dead. Uh, <laughs> no, no uh, we did that all the time because uh, this was the opportunity to meet the, the next one. You see, uh, we had a, a meeting with Chernyenko, and Chernyenko was really sick as well. They showed him up once in, on TV, uh, uh, accompanied with two uh, go, uh, guys who kept him stand up, you see, because he couldn't, he couldn't walk uh, by himself anymore. And he, they demonstrated, look, he is still alive. <laughs> yeah? And we went again a year later to his funeral. <laughs> <laughs> and then we met Gorbachev the first time in uh, 85, springtime, March 85. And suddenly there was a young and healthy Secretary General. And this was already, already an important improvement. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I tell the story because uh, uh, sometimes in politics uh, you face situations which are not really uh, uh, comfortable. And, uh, and talking then about war and, and uh, missiles. Uh, and I, n I never will forget how proud the Russians were of the SS-20, of these middle, nuclear middle-range systems. And uh, we had a meeting with the Soviet uh, defense secretary at that time. And with, he was accompanied with uh, four Soviet marshals. There's a lot of medals here, yeah? but they are strong guys, therefore they uh, had, haven't had to bow all the time. Uh, <laughs> and uh, our Foreign Minister Genscher asked uh, the Defense Secretary, the Soviet Defense Secretary, how many SS-20 do you have? And I never will forget his face. He, was, he started grinning. Uh, Grinson, is that okay? Yeah, grin. <laughs> and uh, said only one word, Bolge, mehr, more, more. He didn't tell us how many, but I never will forget how proud he was to, to demonstrate that they have a hell lot of such nuclear missiles pointing at us, not at you, at the Americans, at us, you see? This was really strange because they started this arms race with middle-range nuclear systems after the CSC summit in Helsinki, 75. The, the, this was the peak of the detente policy in Europe. And the main promoter of this policy of detente was Willy Brandt, you see? Uh, and uh, I, uh, I had the opportunity 10 days, 10 days ago in Vienna um, there was a, a panel on the German unification as well, and on my panel was a former member of the Soviet Politburo, uh, Vadim Medvedev. He has nothing to do with the current president. And I asked him, why was it possible that the Europeans, who were the main promoters of the policy of detente, were suddenly punished by a new arms race not against the Americans, against us. And he said, well, Mr. Telchik, uh, there's, uh, there's, there are different things. There's a nice paper, yeah? This is the final act of the CSC from Helsinki, and there are national interests. <laughs> yeah, so easy, huh? so easy. Well, uh, this Hungarian, coming back to my speech here, uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, uh, the speech will t take a little bit more time if I should tell such stories, but uh, <laughs> I think uh, for the students uh, it might be of some interest. Uh, 
This young uh, ambassador in, in uh, 84 showed up in my office and he told me immediately, Hung in Hungary everything has to be changed. They have to start po economic reforms, political reforms, uh, because they are close to bankrupt and uh, they need the support of the German government. And I was really not sure whether he is just play, uh, playing a game with me, yeah, or whether he is uh, serious. And uh, I learned very, very quickly that he was really serious. He took me to Hungary. I met uh, 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 most of the members of the government. And uh, I met mainly two guys who were at that time in this, uh, working in the Central Committee of the Communist, of the Hungarian Communist Party. This was Chula Horn, uh, the later on uh, the foreign minister. He was the head of the Department for Foreign Affairs in the Central Committee. And I met uh, Nemet Miklos, uh, the later on the prime minister, who was the head of the Department for Economic Affairs. And these young guys, told me, well, uh, we have to change things. We have uh, to force our leadership to retire, and we would do that if Germany would support us. And they did it. They uh, uh, exchanged uh, the, the, his, their leader, and Mr. Prime Minister Gross took over. And I was his first visitor from the West, together with a with the CEO of the German bank, Deutsche Bank, Herrhausen, you might know him. Herrhausen uh, accompanied me and we ne were negotiating a credit of one billion Deutsche Mark for Hungary. And uh, half a year later, these young guys showed up again in Bonn at my office telling me it makes no sense with, Mr. with our prime, new prime minister we can't, he, he will not be successful, we have to exchange him, we have to take over by ourselves. And they did. And these guys started reforms, and uh, what was really fundamental, they opened the border, you see. And 10,000 of uh, GDR refugees who spent their holidays in Hungary took the chance to cross the border via Austria to Germany. This uh, was the first, as German Chancellor Helmut Kohl has said in the Hungarian parliament at uh, the end of the year 89, this was the first stone broken out of the wall by the Hungarians. And we were celebrating this, uh, this year as well. Uh, in 89, uh, ladies and gentlemen, about 120,000 GDR refugees escaped via Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and Poland. Mainly young people, families with small children, and academics. And having been asked how they feel about when they crossed the border, there was more or less just one answer. Finally free. Finally free. I think we shouldn't forget that. They didn't say, now we can buy Western products. No, no, freedom. Freedom was the main uh, desire of these people. And on October 7th, 20 years ago, the SED leadership, the Communist Party of the GDR, celebrated the 40th anniversary of the foundation of the GDR. President. Michael Gorbachev took part. On the verge of the official ceremony, including a military parade, marching up with torches, the police were beating opposition demonstrators with sticks, many got seriously wounded, hundreds were put into prison. And Gorbachev's famous statement from that day is often quoted, and uh, JD did it already this afternoon, I do believe only those are in danger who don't respond to life. Later, the quote was changed into life itself punishes those 
who fall behind. On the very same day, the first mass demonstration against the GDR regime started in the city of Plauen and on the next day in Leipzig with 70,000 people. Within a few days, we could witness peaceful demonstrations all over the country, ending with several hundred thousand people in the streets shouting, we are the people, we are the people. And fortunately adding, no violence, no violence. They had put candles in front of the Secret Service building. This was crucial because GDR officials had assembled 8,000 armed personnel, among them 80 police companies supported by armed corporate security militias, members of the Secret Service, special forces, and members of the army with machine guns and other weapons. One of these officers had told me once, he, he was uh, lying behind bushes with uh, machine guns and, uh, and guns. And when the demonstrators came up, he told his people, don't shoot, my son is there as well, you see. They were ready to suppress the unrest. Fortunately, it did not happen. There were too many people in the streets and regional party members, as J.D. had uh, explained to you, had intervened. There are stories that one member of the Secret Service said, we were prepared to meet all challenges, but not candles and prayers. Because the demonstration started in churches. Good to know. Hmm? <laughs> A few weeks later, the slogan of the demonstrations changed to, we are one people. And a month later, the wall came down peacefully. Not one shot was fired. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we should recall all results from the years 89 to 91. Germany was reunited. All neighboring countries had agreed, even Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> Germany got back its full sovereignty 45 years after World War II. There was a final settlement for the German-Polish border. This was never a question for my chancellor and for the government, never. The only question was the right time. And because of uh, our legal system, we couldn't acknowledge the border only after the reunification, finally, and not before. The Warsaw Pact peacefully disbanded. 500,000 Soviet troops left Central Europe, 350 out of them from the GDR. I had uh, discussions with the Soviet ambassador at that time to learn how many Russians are living uh, uh, in, in the GDR. He never told me the figure. Our assessment was at the end, between one million and one and a half million Russians were living in, uh, in the GDR. And our, one of our main tasks was to get them out peacefully and on time. Uh, and, we, and we made it. You see, uh, the agreement uh, between this Gorbachev and Helmut Kohl was within four years, all troops must have left uh, 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 the GDR. And we helped them, we supported them to do that. Uh, we, uh, we, were, we paid a program of about three billion uh, Deutschmark to build housing for uh, the uh, troops coming home because the problem for the Soviets has been they have had no housing for their soldiers uh, going back to Soviet Union. And we uh, financed a training program for, such, for those officers uh, who wanted to become manager in business and so on. Therefore, we, did, we spent a hell lot of money to help them to get them out. And I never will forget the ceremony when the last troops left Berlin. There was uh, a Soviet uh, 
group of soldiers singing a song in German language, singing, we came to Germany as enemies. We are leaving Germany as friends. This was really moving, really moving. Uh, this was 94. Uh, the East-West conflict had ended, and with it, the bipolar world. Europe is not divided anymore. The Soviet Union broke up into 15 sovereign states. Communist ideology all but disappeared. We signed the most far-reaching arms control and arms reduction agreements. Think of START, strategic systems, INF, middle uh, range systems, CFE, conventional uh, uh, arms. Uh, we got a global ban on chemical and biological weapons. Uh, unbelievable what was possible uh, these years. And as you know, new democracies and market economies were developing. If you read, if you listen to such a list, isn't it a miracle? Not one shot was fired. Within two years, we got that. And I tell you, I have a close friend uh, in, in Munich, uh, he's a Jesuit, uh, he's 90 years, not 92, his uh, father uh, here. Uh, and he, he told me all the time, somebody had helped you from above. And I think it, he is true. Uh, this was a peaceful revolution. It changed Germany, it changed Europe, and it changed the world. It happened because of a unique political and personal constellation. Solidarność in Poland, our friends Nemet Miklos and Horn Jula in Hungary, the courage of our common friend Michael Gorbachev, because he didn't interfere anymore, as he did before in, in Czechoslovakia, in Hungary, in East Berlin. Not he, but his predecessors. It was uh, the, peop the people in the GDR and because of the unrestricted support of our American friends, above all from President George Bush and his great team. We are really grateful for the unreserved trust in the German government at that time, mainly in Chancellor Helmut Kohl and his team, and for the great friendship. The Germans and I personally will never forget what the Americans have done for Germany and for Europe. Let me just add one sentence. My friend Brent Krogroff, the National Security Advisor of President George Bush, once told me that in 89-90 in the White House, they sometimes held their breath recognizing what Chancellor Kohl and his team were doing and how fast we were moving ahead. But they didn't interfere because of the, of the mutual trust and ongoing mutual briefings. It was one of the best times in German-US relations. Germany was reunited within 329 days after the wall had come down. Nobody had expected that it would happen that fast. Our assessment in November 89, when Helmut Kohl gave his famous 10-point speech in the, in the German parliament, uh, developing a strategy how we want to move ahead to a unified Germany, uh, our assessment had been that it would take five to 10 years to unify Germany. It took us less than one year. Why did it happen so fast? Well, ladies and gentlemen, it was a window of opportunity. Indeed, there was no other comparable important topic on the international agenda which could have distracted the attention of our partners away from Germany. When Saddam Hussein occupied Kuwait in August 90, the main issues between Germany and the Soviet Union were already resolved. 
this was fundamental because from this very moment on, the US administration turned all its attention to Iraq. The coup d'etat in Moscow against President Gorbachev happened in 91 and not in 89 or 90. But this could have been. Together with our allies, we were frightened at all times that Gorbachev could be toppled because of the extent of changes he initiated in his own country and which were undergoing in Poland, Hungary, and GDR. Miklos Neman, the Prime Minister of Hungary, told me in, in 89, we, we, are not, we are not going to ask uh, Gorbachev whether we are allowed to move ahead with reforms or not. We just do it, and we, will, we wait and see whether he will in interfere or not. And he didn't. And I think this is a real historic merit of Gorbachev, that he stick to his promise from the very beginning on. He had told his uh, allies in the Warsaw Pact already at the summit, Warsaw Pact summit in 88, that he won't interfere in the internal in the internal, in dom, uh, internal uh, affairs uh, in their countries. And he, he promised that and he did it. He didn't interfere in Poland, neither in Hungary, and at least not in Germany, not in the GDR. I think this is really what we have to, pra what we have to praise him for. Uh, the main cause of the speed Ladies and gentlemen, and I, I do know, still uh, uh, to, uh, my friend uh, Jim Baker gave, just gave an interview in a German newspaper saying, well, uh, it was, everything was too fast, moving too fast. Uh, Shivat Nazi publicly said, everything goes too fast. Everybody was claiming it's too fast. Mitterrand, too fast. Margaret Thatcher, uh, for sure. <laughs> uh, well, but who was, who, who was it pushing us? It was not my, our government. Uh, it, was, it was the people of the TDR. So simple. Their desire for unification became already obvious all throughout 89. About 40,000 people had officially applied to leave the GDR in 89. About 120,000, as I have told you, came illegally to Germany via Hungary, Poland, and Czechoslovakia. And when Chancellor Helmut Kohl met the newly elected GDR leader Hans Modrow on December 19th in Dresden, thousands of people were calling for unification. And I tell you, it was obvious to us that Modro would not be able to run the GDR. I took part in the meeting of uh, Helmut Kohl and Modro. And this guy, was, he was really unbelievable. He started to read a paper for half an hour. This was a, a, a paper agreed in the Politburo, as always, as all the communist leaders did uh, in the past. Uh, just reading at the beginning uh, uh, a paper uh, agreed in the, on the Politburo, including everything. Uh, and I thought by myself, this guy doesn't know what's going on in his own country. Uh, close to collapse, being bankrupt, and then he is reading a paper on arms control, on, on peace, on, uh, and uh, whatever but not how he would uh, run uh, the GDR further on. The only interest he had that we should give him 15 billion Deutschmark uh, to buy goods from West Germany to supply it uh, to the East Germans. And uh, after the meeting, there was a, a private meeting between Kohl and, uh, and Modro. I, I didn't take part. But afterwards, when uh, I joined them again, Modro uh, approached me and he said, well, I would like to tell you, I, I just discussed it with your chancellor. We will, uh, we will uh, appoint 
uh, two uh, special envoys to negotiate this 15 billion uh, uh, support. And he told me, you are his special envoy. <laughs> and I thought, the hell, why should I, well, why should I do that? And I, I'm really proud. There was never a meeting. <laughs> and they never got 15 billion. <laughs> no. But we got the unification. Uh, I tried hard to prevent a meeting. And fortunately, I was successful. Uh, day by day, more people from the GDR were moving to West Germany. Our project, projection was in February 19 that we would get up to one million refugees till the end of the year 1990. This foreseeable burden would have been too high for both Germanys. The GDR was losing mainly young people, families, with children and academics, and wouldn't survive this loss. And we were facing a lack of available housing and jobs. Therefore, we had to act as fast as possible to prevent a chaotic situation on both sides. But we did, being aware that all our partners in East and West were deeply concerned about the speed. Chancellor Kohl moved ahead and history has proved him right. Later on he said, we have to harvest before the thunderstorm comes, you see. But there was an an important advantage, I told you about my meeting with this member of the Politburo, Vadim Medvedev, uh, member of the Politburo during Gorbachev's time. Uh, I asked him about the assessments of the Soviet leadership on the various events and decisions in both German states. His answer was remarkable. He told me that the think tank, he called it think tank, I don't know whether they had people who could think at that time. Uh, he told me that the think tank of the Soviet leadership was not able to review everything in good time. My conclusion is good for us. Yeah? Decisions on our side had been so quick that Moscow seemed incapable of responding in time. I'm really convinced that that's, this is true. On the other side, it was Gorbachev's great historic achievement that he broke with the past. He was ready to accept the political developments in Poland, Hungary, and Germany, and he did not use military force to intervene as his predecessors did before. <laughs> Two conclusions remain important for Germany, still to today. First, Chancellor Kohl was surprised about President Mitterrand's initial reluctance to support the process of unification. You have to uh, remember that uh, uh, Mitterrand was four or five days before the wall came down in Bonn. There was a bilateral summit, German-French summit, and both were discussing the events going on in Poland, in Hungary, in, Czech, in, in, in East Germany, in, in Russia, in Soviet Union. And uh, Helmut Kohl uh, said, well, Francois, uh, after our meeting, we, we have a press conference. Uh, I would um, suggest that you explain to the German media the French position to the famous German question. Uh, what is the French position uh, about unification of Germany? And Francois did. And I tell you, I was really impressed how friendly it was. Yeah? He was uh, really in favor of our German position. He was in favor of the right of self-determination and uh, for unification of Germany. And uh, therefore, we were really surprised when we learned that when, when it came up, uh, this issue, that he suddenly was so reluctant. Uh, Mitterrand's main concern had been that a united Germany, then stronger than France, 
would not continue its close partnership with France and the process of European integration. <coughs> that was the reason why Chancellor Kohl had sent me in January 90 to Paris to propose a new common German-French initiative for a political union. And how polit politics works, uh, dear students. Uh, this is a typical example. Uh, Ellis, my, my counterpart in the LEC, Jacques Deli, was really excited about my proposal. And he said, well, that's great. Let's do it. But we couldn't agree on details. What does it mean, political union? We just could agree on the goal of a political union. But it was at the end good enough because we said, well, if we fix the goal, the content will follow up later on. And it did partly. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, this initi initiative was agreed by all member states of the European community in April at their summit in Dublin. Later on, as you know, followed by the Economic and Monetary Union and by the introduction of the Euro. And because it was mentioned uh, this afternoon, f my French friends still say today, uh, well, Germany had to pay a price. That's the Euro, the Monetary uh, and Economic Union, and the Political Union. That's crazy. Because we discussed it already beginning in the middle of the 80s. Uh, I, rem uh, I had a meeting once with Jacques Adeli and he said, well, we, of course, we have already a, a common uh, uh, currency. That's a Deutschmark. But as French, we can't accept that. We need, we need a different uh, currency. And uh, there was no question. Helmut Kohl was always in favor of, in of the integration of, of Europe. The second lesson we had to learn a united Germany was and is only acceptable to all European countries, neighboring Germany and to the US, as long as we are common allies in the Atlantic Alliance. A non-aligned or neutral Germany would have been a nightmare <coughs> and will be a nightmare for all our neighbors. Germans should never forget their history. Look at today's Poland and Czech Republic how nervous they react when Germany is attempting to develop a close and friendly relationship with Russia. When I was asked to, uh, to meet Gorbachev uh, privately uh, in May 90 in Moscow, uh, I had to negotiate again a credit of 5 billion uh, Deutschmark for the Soviet Union. If we wouldn't, if we, if we had not be willing to give them this credit of five billion, the world power Soviet Union would have been bankrupt end of June 90. Yeah? Uh, 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 unbelievable, yeah? Uh, what, that, what that would have mean, meant for them. Uh, and uh, Gorbachev uh, had asked me, well, Mr. Telchik, we will be now friends and close partners in the, f the future. Why do you need a NATO anymore? And I told him, Mr. President, perhaps not because of Soviet Union anymore, because indeed we want to become partners in France. But I said, think of our neighbors, uh, the neighbors of Germany, Luxembourg, Netherlands, Denmark, Poland. They cannot live with a Germany uh, outside of, of the alliance. They, they can live with us with a bigger and stronger Germany only if we are in a common alliance. And this is true. And many Germans don't believe that. Yeah? I, I try always hard to explain that to them because they, the young people in Germany say we are Democrats, we are, we are pacifists, uh, we are good guys. Uh, why are people afraid of Germany? Well, because of our history. So simple. There's one lesson in my life. People don't forget history. And uh, if you go to uh, countries abroad for negotiations, whether in business or politics, you have to know about the common history. That's really fundamental. 
Therefore, Germany's membership in NATO and the European Union is part of Germany's raison d'etat. Both alliances have been a prerequisite for unifying Germany. They remain a prerequisite to overcome distrust against Germany. We face other implications 20 years after the end of the Cold War. NATO had to adjust first. NATO had to adjust its strategy to the new challenges and threats we have been facing since that time. Its strategy was revised several times. In April this year, NATO has again decided to, rev to review its strategy. NATO is still trying to define its future role. And after the war in Kosovo, and now fighting a war for eight years in Afghanistan, we still don't know whether NATO should have just a regional responsibility or, or at the end, a global one. Should we enlarge NATO further on or not? Why Alba Albania? What about Georgia and the Ukraine? Should we in the long run allow Russia into NATO? as President Clinton once proposed to President Yeltsin by a letter and personally. I tell you, I cannot explain it now because of the time. I'm in favor of that in the long run. What about Japan, Australia, or New Zealand, or others? Some in the US want to establish a special relationship between NATO and those countries. Secondly, the European Union is still undergoing two difficult processes the deepening of the integration and enlargement. Two key questions are not yet answered and all politicians try hard not to talk about it, leaving it to the future. A so-called wait and see approach. Uh, many politicians prefer such an approach, wait and see. We will see what, what, what might happen and what we, how we can settle a problem. What should be the final status of the European Union? The United Nations of Europe, or a confederation of states, or just a free trade area, as Margaret Thatcher had preferred? How large should the European Union be at the very end? Should Turkey or Israel or others at some point become members of the European Union? Nevertheless, the European Union is a unique success story whether our American friends believe it or not. <laughs> I'm, I, uh, sometimes I think it was a real shame uh, uh, that our American friends uh, are not really willing to take us seriously. Uh, because it's a success story. What can, what, what can Europe stabilize more than this European Union? Peace, stability, and freedom. Nothing else. Thirdly, in November 1990, there was a CSCE summit in Paris, CSCE's Conference uh, of Security and Cooperation in Europe. All 35 presidents and heads of government signed a so-called charter for a new Europe. After the end of the Cold War, they wanted to start, I quote, a new era of democracy, peace, and unity. They agreed on common principles, how to shape a new Europe. They developed a mechanism to avoid confrontations, to manage crises, and to settle conflicts peacefully. What a vision. What a dream. I, it had reminded me of the famous speech of Martin Luther, Martin Luther King, I have a dream. Ladies and gentlemen, I have this dream. Should a united, a free and democratic Europe from Vancouver to Vladivostok not be our dream? In May 91, President Mitterrand said in Aachen, Aachen is a German city, I quote him, for a long time Europe has not had so many reasons for hope. I think he was absolutely right. For the first time in the history, of the European continent, we might have the chance 
to build the all-European peace and security order. In 1990, we, we, we got for the first time the perhaps irretrievable chance for building a common European house, as Gorbachev put it, for creating a community of free states founded on the rule of law and guaranteeing the security of all members. After a century of two world wars with over 200 people killed, what could be better for peace, freedom, and security than such an all-European system of peace and security. The Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir once said, who has not a dream is not a realist. But in substance, nothing has really happened since 1990. We wasted 20 years. The CSE was renamed, you know, now known as OSCE. It is mainly taking care of human rights and observing elections. For Russia, OSCE is now mainly an instrument to interfere in its, in its internal affairs. We must not care about Russia's complaints, but what's about an all-European system of peace and security? In June 2008, President Medvedev gave a speech in Berlin suggesting again an European security order from Vancouver to Vladivostok. He only mentioned few principles, avoiding any details. A Russian official told me that otherwise the West would have immediately thrown the proposal off the table. So interesting, such an answer. So far, there was no substan substantial response by anyone. The first step was done a few weeks ago by President Obama and President Medvedev. They have now agreed on a common working group to follow up the Russian proposal. The Europeans are again in a wait-and-see position because it's easier to criticize a possible outcome but it's more difficult to come up with proposals of their own, typical for the Europeans. And then we are criticizing the American proposals. That's easy. The fourth uh, issue I would like to mention is, let me conclude with the last implication. It was President George Bush in 1901 demanding a new world order after the end of the bipolar world. There was no response by anyone. But we have got a new world order, a unipolar one with the US as the only world power. But after the US military intervention in Iraq and Afghanistan, Russia, China, and India started to question a world order dominated only by the United States. And they are now demanding a multipolar world. Now we are indeed moving in this direction. Possible poles are for sure the United States, China, India, Japan, Brazil, Russia, and hopefully once the European Union. Such a multipolar world order reminds me of the European order in the 18th, 19th centuries, where various great powers as France, Great Britain on the one side trying hard to counterbalance other great powers, such as Prussia, Russia, or the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, or vice versa. The German Chancellor at that time, von Bismarck, was famous for upholding this balance of power between the different poles. It resulted, nevertheless, ladies and gentlemen, in two devastating world wars. Just one example from today. Look at the WTO, the World Trade Organization. Look at the negotiations where India and Brazil and behind them China have formed an alliance against industrialized countries, preventing any progress. There are already poles playing against other poles. A multipolar world would not naturally be a safe world order. Therefore, we are all are forced to play an active role 
and to take up global responsibility in one way or the other. And we should be aware that the United States and the European Union are natural partners. Who else could it be today than European Union and the United States? A lot remains to do. I, I didn't even mention economic globaliz globalization with all its repercussions facing this nightmare of a global financial crisis and recession. And if you think back, the globalization, uh, the opening up of China and uh, India started uh, close uh, end of the uh, uh, um, 70s and uh, end of the 80s and early 90s uh, uh, at the same time when the world order changed. Uh, I didn't even uh, mention arms control. For 20 years, nothing moved ahead. Now, fortunately, the Americans and the Soviet Russians are now negotiating a follow-up treaty to, uh, to, start, to the START agreement about the strategic nuclear systems, 20 years after. But nothing is going on on conventional systems and other parts, short-range missiles. Nevertheless, mainly we Europeans and our American friends have many reasons to be grateful for what happened 20 years ago. After that peaceful revolution, we got new opportunities to shape a peaceful Europe and a better world. No generation before us had similar opportunities. They even didn't dare to dream of it. But what we need now are politicians, business leaders, and academics and social elites of all kinds with a historic understanding, far-sighted, strategic and global thinkers with the courage to take decisions and to act. Let's do it. Thank you. Well, uh, so uh, fortunately, NATO is uh, uh, not questioned anymore. Besides the so-called leftist party, uh, the members of the leftist, leftist party in Germany are mainly the former communists of the, uh, the communists of the former GDR. You know, uh, uh, quite often uh, there is a discussion whether the East Germans are satisfied with the unification or not. There was just a poll saying two-thirds of the East Germans are satisfied of the German unification. And uh, I always remind people that we had 2.1 million members of the Communist Party in the former GDR, and they all lost privileges. And we didn't shot them after the unification. They are still there. Uh, and uh, they, they are voting for this left wing, leftist party. They are, this party is questioning uh, NATO, but n nobody else in Germany. Therefore, it's not an issue. An issue is not, will come up now, that's Afghanistan. But you know how difficult it is to settle Afghanistan. It's a difficult discussion here and a difficult discussion in, in Europe. And I think we will face tremendous problems. And uh, 
it's easy to say, uh, uh, go out of Afghanistan. If we fail in Afghanistan, then NATO will fail, not only Obama and the Americans. It's a NATO issue. And I, I, I wonder all, all the time why many Americans do as, as would they fight alone in Afghanistan. Uh, and my friend Henry Kissinger just published an article. If you read it, you get the impression only the Americans are fighting there. Uh, and only the Americans will lose or win the battle. No, no, we will lose or win the battle together. Uh, the European Union. Well, there's a lot of critics from all sides. Uh, whether there's a big bureaucracy in Brussels, uh, which is more and more dominating uh, domestic affairs. Well, uh, this is not quite fair. Because uh, decisions of the European Union are always compromises between t 27 heads of government. Yeah? And therefore, it's never a satisfying uh, result. There's compromise is never good enough uh, for, for understandable reasons. And these politicians who take, but they take decisions, then they went home to the national parliaments and are claiming, well, uh, with, uh, there's a decision in Brussels taken, it's not good enough, uh, we, are, we are angry, and then they expect that the people uh, are in favor of the European Union. This can't work, you see? And, the, and, uh, and during the elections we just had, we had politicians criticizing the European Union, asking them, why are you doing that? They said, well, uh, we are close to our voters. <coughs> they are criticizing the European Union, and therefore we have to, to uh, follow them. But the, the, the voters are criticizing because they learned it from the politicians. It's a vicious circle. Uh, I think, uh, nevertheless, the European Union is a success story. We must go ahead. Uh, and uh, you see, we can't uh, leave the European Union just to the politicians. Academics have to talk to tell the, sh the students that this is a, a really brilliant uh, uh, goal and that it is worthwhile to fight for it. And, uh, well, uh, many are uh, questioning, well, there's all the time crisis in the European Union. I tell you, I'm very much in favor of crisis. If you watch the history of the European Union, it's a history of crisis. But if you look what happened with that crisis, when I started in, in, the, in the government, uh, we started with a fundamental crisis in 83 in the European Union, and we were chairing the European Union. And uh, Margaret Thatcher was fighting Mitterrand. My, Mitterrand left the, the room uh, uh, he, because he was deeply uh, insulted by, by Mark, Maggie Thatcher, Helmut Kohl, who was the chairman. He went uh, out and, uh, try and uh, brought uh, Mitterrand back to the negotiating table. It was really tough, but we overcame this crisis. And if you look at the history of the European Union, we moved forward when there was a crisis before. Therefore, I'm very much in favor of crisis, fundamental crisis of the European Union. Then we have some courageous politicians who settle the problem and move, move ahead. I think this is not, European Union NATO is uh, accepted whether you are elder, elderly or youngster. But the youngsters, you see, the only problem we face with youngsters, traveling up, uh, uh, around Europe without any border uh, um, checks, Without, uh, you can, you, with the same uh, currency, and, and, and. All these advantages, they get used to it. It's natural, yeah? When I travel now to Poland, to, to Prague, to Hungary, you cross the border, there is no border anymore. 
it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah? Yes, you are a big continent. You have no border here. Uh, uh, but uh, think of uh, a situation if Texas would have a border, uh, Indiana to Chicago, and, uh, and uh, suddenly this border is gone. Our youngsters are used to it. Therefore, they don't know, they are not aware of the value of such developments of such decisions. That's a problem. Another student question, please. Ah, yeah. Hi, I'm Priscilla, and I'm from South Korea. So you can come to the microphone, Priscilla. Oh, okay. Here, here, are mics. Hello, I'm from South Korea. So uh, when I like hear about German unification, it, al it always comes into mind like the relationship between North and South Korea. So I have two questions. Um, when the wall broke down in 1989, what were the implications of that incident to Asian countries, like Asian communist countries like China, Vietnam, or um, North Korea? And the second question is, it seems like um, the situation of East Germany in 1989 seems really different from the current situation of North Korea. North Korea is much more isolated and um, like the dictatorship is really high and people like admire the dictator. So do you think it's not possible, like the peaceful unification of North and South Korea is impossible? Like, what's your view about that? Well, uh, <laughs> there is a significant repercussion on China. For China, the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the uh, break off uh, of, uh, of Soviet Union is a nightmare. And uh, China will try hard to prevent a development uh, which might lead to, uh, to a situation where China could break off. Uh, think of, uh, uh, of the Uyghurs in uh, Xinjiang, uh, what's going on there. Uh, I, just, I've, um, I sp just spent uh, in May this year holidays in, in Xinjiang. Uh, and uh, I, I uh, drove by car for one week through this uh, province. And you can see uh, how strategically important this province is for China. Uh, you have brilliant highways, you have uh, new railways, uh, you have airports. This is not because they want to, uh, they are very much in favor of the Uyghurs. No, this province is of strategic uh, importance for China because if this province will break off, they face a problem. Uh, they have a lot of oil and gas there. They need this province. But uh, this is a there is a strong minority of Uyghurs. Uh, and uh, therefore, the, the Chinese uh, will do everything to... Uh, to keep a strong party as uh, the main instrument uh, to run this country and a strong army to keep, uh, to keep uh, the country together. And uh, uh, therefore, uh, they face a lot of difficulties to, to liberalize uh, China uh, for political reasons. And uh, Korea, I'm quite often to uh, South Korea and I always meet the Minister for Unification and uh, I always get the same questions. The, the, the ministers change every two years uh, in, in uh, South Korea. And I always get the same question. When do you think it might happen, unification of Korea? And I, say, I tell them, you never know, it can happen tomorrow. It can happen in next year. It can happen in five years. Who knows? You see, if the system is bankrupt, it can uh, collapse every day. Who knows? Then the other question, 
Do, have you had a plan in your desk uh, how to unify Germany? <laughs> My answer is all the time, fortunately not, because it would have been wrong. Yeah? You can't plan uh, such a situation. Um, I'm absolutely sure that uh, you can develop a hell lot of plans. They will, will be all wrong. The only thing what they can do better than we did is to think about the economic development of North Korea if the unification will start and how to prevent that the North Koreans immediately will uh, move to the south. That's a real problem. Uh, and therefore, they, they need a plan how to uh, start investments immediately to keep the people in, in North Korea. And the other thing you can, they can learn from us is they need support from outside. Uh, one are the Americans. There is some anti-Americanism in Korea. And uh, I try to convince them that the main support we have got, we got by the Americans for two reasons. They took care of our security, and this was our prior first priority. Uh, and uh, we could move because we were safe, because of the alliance and the friendship with the Americans. I think this is necessary to tell the South Koreans they need, for security reasons, Americans, whether they like them or not. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. And uh, the other point is the most influential neighboring country is China on uh, North Korea. Therefore, they, South Korea must have an um, an interest to develop close fri and friendly relations with China. As better the relations are, as better for them. Otherwise, China won't support uh, uh, unification. And, uh, well, there are others like uh, Russia, there's the talks of six parties, six party talks including Russia and Japan, they are not as important. But nevertheless, it's good to have them as friends. Therefore, they can learn from us, uh, try hard to develop good relations with all these uh, neighboring countries. This might be helpful. Uh, and uh, the last point I try to explain them, it's good to develop the so-called sunshine policy. What does it mean? It means uh, that bilaterally, South and North Korea should try hard uh, to, to uh, develop small steps, but nevertheless steps to, for cooperation, for kind ever, uh, to prevent that people uh, got uh, alienated, alienated, and uh, to keep them uh, together. Of, what they just did, family reunion. I think this is very important. And uh, I think uh, these are lessons they can learn from us. Now, I'll take uh, questions from the whole group, but, uh, Why don't I suggest uh, that I collect a few of them? And please keep them very short and precise. My and answer's not too long. Huh? Your answers are excellent. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just concerned not to provoke lectures out in the the audience. Um, yourself and Chancellor challenge to President Gorbachev to tear down this wall. What was the immediate reaction to that speech? And one more short question? Yes. When will Czechoslovakia give in and um, help with the renovation of the European Union? Okay. Okay. Yeah, on, on Turkey, uh, <clears throat> well, Turkey is, all, is for, many decades, for many decades, from the very beginning, a uh, member of the, of the NATO. And uh, you see, uh, uh, when we wrote speeches for the chancellor explaining NATO, why NATO is necessary, we always said uh, it's not only a military organization, it's... Uh, it's more important, it's a political uh, alliance with common values. Yeah? 
And now we have the discussion on Turkey and the membership of the European Union. And the, many or the most of the European Union members, uh, members of the European Union says, well, we can't take uh, Turkey into uh, European Union because there are no common values. Yeah? Yeah. Well, uh, it's not an easy question, but uh, you see, we promised Turkey to become a member of the European Union by, a, by an, an agreement. Uh, and, you know, we always uh, have said in politics, Pacta sunt servanda. If there's an agreement, you have to stick to it. Uh, secondly, it's, uh, negotiations are going on. Therefore, we are seriously negotiating. Uh, it will take time to come to a final uh, result that might take 10 years, it might take even 15 years. And who knows what will happen in 10 years? What will be the situation in 10 years? But it's still, it's really difficult. It's not an easy decision. Because, uh, you see, we, we have a, we are, Germany has, has traditionally a very close relationship with Turkey. Uh, we built the first railway there, our German emperor and so on. Uh, we have many Turks. We have, Berlin is the third largest Turkish city in the world. Um, but uh, the, the real problem are the cultural differences, religious differences. And as long as uh, uh, young, young girls are killed, Turkish girls are killed in Germany by their brothers or fathers because they uh, want to live as the Germans, as the German uh, girls, then you don't find a lot of friends to support uh, the membership, you see. And uh, we just, just now is a, a discussion going on. Are Turks really willing or able to, be, to integrate? And many say, not yet. And um, we built a hell lot of mosques in Germany. But there is n we are, nobody is allowed to build a Christian church in Turkey. Yeah? Therefore, these are the, the problems. Uh, they want all rights here in Germany, but they don't accept similar rights at home. And therefore, it's a vice versa. Uh, uh, it must be a deal. You have to change, and we have to move. And this can take 10 years, but why not? I tell uh, the Turks, my Turkish friends all the time, when I was in government, I had a Swiss, a Swiss counterpart, and he told me once, well, our politics vis-a-vis -vis European Union is, uh, we are eager for an external integration. What does it, <laughs> what does it mean? It means uh, we are able to join because we do everything uh, what's uh, necessary to be able to join, but we don't join. Yeah? And I tell the, the Turkish uh, partners all the time, that's the right decision for them. Become uh, uh, able to join the European Union. Then it might be just a question of time that they can join. But as long as they are not willing to, to adjust to the rules of the European Union, then it's difficult, you see. Therefore, don't talk about membership. Talk about uh, moving in the right direction. Same with Ukraine, for example. Yeah? Uh, they, should, they should work hard to, to be, become uh, able to join. We've got a, a couple of more questions related uh, to this one. Reagan, Reagan and, uh, well, tear down the wall. I tell you. I took part in that meeting. I was really deeply moved because I was angry of the German media and uh, German opposition parties who were criticizing Reagan. Well, it's cold war, a cold war, yeah? Con uh, uh, 
challenging uh, again the, the Soviets. Uh, uh, why is he doing that? He, he must know there's no chance for uh, bringing down the wall and so on. My position was, look, there is our main partner and alliance partner coming to Germany. We haven't asked him to give that speech. And he's, he stays in front of the wall and tells, uh, and he's telling the, his counterpart in Moscow, tear down the wall in favor of our interests and why we are criticizing him. And two years later, the wall came down. You see? But uh, it's always in German, it's always, you, it's always uh, uh, a game to criticize American presidents. Uh, <laughs> we will see what happens with Obama in a few years. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, European <coughs> Union, what was the question on the, about the European Union? Yeah. Uh, the Czech. Uh, Czech president. Well, I know him for 20 years, this guy. Uh, he plays a terrible, terrible game. And uh, in, in one respect, I do understand the Czechs and the Poles. You know, the Polish president just signed on, on Sunday. You have, but you have to know the uh, national pride, the national feeling, the nationalism of the Poles and the Czechs and the Hungarians was the vehicle to get rid of the Soviet Union, uh, to emancipate, emancipate, emancipate from the Soviet Union. And they were successful at the end. Suddenly they were a sovereign, free country. But it was their choice to enter European Union as soon as possible. And now, and having entered the European Union, they learn they are dependent again. Yeah? It's not Moscow anymore, now it's Brussels. And they have difficulties to accept it. Yeah? And this, this is uh, something uh, I, uh, I really believe we have to understand. Uh, and uh, therefore, I'm not criticizing too much. But Klaus is really crazy because the parliament had agreed, <laughs> the parliament, the government had agreed, but not the president. And in a democracy, when the parliament decides, I think the president and the, and the government, the president had to sign. And now he, he wants a new opt-out clause. Uh, he is suddenly anxious of people like me, as a former refugee, Sudetendeutsche, coming from the uh, uh, Czech, Czech, uh, Czech Republic. He is anxious that we will go back to uh, the Czech Republic and would ask him to, to give us all our property back. Yeah? This is suddenly his fear. I don't know anybody who is asking for his property getting back. Yeah? But uh, he invents all the time new obstacles. And uh, well, I would say uh, if, if they don't sign, let them out. <laughs> yeah? Forget about them. We have time for one more question. OK, your words were that you uh said it was a revolution without a shot. How do you feel that the insiders wanted to deal with the Pope as far as that was concerned? Uh, the, uh, the, you are right, the Pope played an important role. Uh, you see, I think it was the Pope went to, uh, the Polish Pope went to, back to Poland the first time, 88, or when, when, when was it? Do you, Huh? 70, 80? Yeah. And uh, he mobilized one million people, mainly youngsters in Poland. Uh, they came together for uh, a, a holy mass. One million. This was the bankrupt of the Communist Party, the Communist system. 
if a pope can mobilize mainly youngsters of that size, this was uh, the, f the final act for the communist system. Uh, therefore, he played uh, indeed a crucial role because he supported Solidarność. And uh, I, I tell you, I admire a guy as uh, Valenza. If you think about him, he was at school just for four years in his lifetime. Four years he went to school. Then he was an electrician uh, in, a, uh, uh, in the Werft shipyard, shift, uh, ship docks. And, uh, and he became the leader of uh, this uh, movement, Solidarność. And he, thrown, uh, he overthrew the communist system. Unbelievable. He is a strange guy. I know him uh, quite well. He, he carries a, a big picture of uh, Holy Mary on his, uh, all the time on his chest. Uh, and uh, he's uh, speaking very loud and powerful and uh, sometimes very crazy. But, uh, <laughs> He was extremely successful, and therefore, I admire. He was. He's not uh, in a democracy. Not a, not the best politician, because how to to cope with uh, democracy is not so easy for him. But <laughs> nevertheless, he did a great job. Thank you, Dr. this giant uh, <laughs> thing. They, you probably thought, oh, I don't want to take that on. The <laughs> well, right. Don't let them give that to me. So <laughs> It's smaller, the picture. What, yeah. uh, what we have for you is the um, same thing. <laughs> in that little tube. Okay. And um, then we also have some other small gifts here. One is we always advertise this for universities. It's a very nice picture book of Notre Dame. Uh, but most importantly, so you don't uh, forget your visit, but also I know you can probably use something like this. Here's something to carry around, all of your conference materials and uh, memos. And so thank, thank you, you very much, much for a wonderful, wonderful.